Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Charles. This week, we're cheating the format for Vacation Month just a little bit, as I won't be bringing you a full story, a full book. Instead, we're going to use this time to catch up on Legends of the Rhine, with all of the stories that we've told thus far, so that on Monday, we can dig back in with new tales. I hope that you all have enjoyed this little retelling of our favorite tales, and I look forward to all new stories beginning Monday. This is Wilhelm Ruland's Legends of the Rhine. Last year, I made the journey between Mainz and Bonn on one of our splendid Rhine steamers. Our vessel glided along like a great water bird. On the shore rose mountains, castles, and ruins, and all over the sun shined brightly from a blue August sky. It was twelve years since I had visited the scenes of my youth, and every Rhinelander will understand with what pleasure I saw again those smiling landscapes arrayed in their summer beauty. Wandering back to my deck chair, I soon became absorbed in the ever-changing panorama. Then, the sound of a melodious female voice speaking English fell on my ears. I looked around. A girl was bending over a book and entertaining her father and mother by reading something of special interest and beauty. I listened, and recognized some of my own sentences rendered into the speech of Shakespeare. These three were learning to feel the charms of the Lorelei legend as I had felt it. I confess, my pulse beat quicker as I heard my poor endeavors highly praised, and I could not refrain from advancing and thanking the young reader for her kindly appreciation of my endeavors. She seemed delighted when she discovered that I was the author, and rose to greet me in the most amiable manner. I complimented the travelers that during the past century the Rhine had become the home of romance for the English-speaking nations, the same as Italy for the Germans. The girl smiled and remarked that I must pay that compliment to her mother in particular, as she was by birth an Englishwoman. But the head of the family hastened to add that among Americans whom he might speak for, the enthusiasm for the beauties of the Rhine was not less than among their Anglo-Saxon cousins. These two nations, which are bound by so many ties to each other and to ourselves, were thus represented before me. The English-speaking people undoubtedly form by far the largest contingent of our Rhine travelers, and it was pleasant indeed to receive so fine a testimonial to the beauties of my birthplace. We had a most interesting conversation, and I was not a little moved as I observed that these foreigners who had traveled over half the world and had seen the grandeur of Switzerland and the charms of Italy should have such an unaffected admiration for our grand old river. I am rather sorry for those who neglect the Rhine. Aren't Longrin and Siegfried immortalized by the great master of Beareth, also heroic figures in your Rhine legends? remarked the young Anglo-American enthusiastically. It was the first time I had seriously thought of this. I was indeed touched, and my thoughts traveled back to the days of long, long ago, when as a chap in my native Bonn, I had first listened with interest to the charming voices of the golden-haired daughters of old Albion, who came in large numbers to reside in the famous Beethoven town. As I separated from my friends at the foot of the Drachsels, I gave them a small present to keep as a memento of the Rhine and one of its poets. Munchen, May 1906 Dr. Wilhelm Ruland. And this is the Petrified Alp. In the region where the Rhine has its source, there towered in ancient times a green alp. This alp belonged to an honest peasant, and along with a neat little house in the valley below formed his only possession. The man died suddenly and was deeply mourned by his wife and child. Some days after, an unexpected visitor was announced to the widow. He was a man who had much pasture land up in that region, but for a long time his one desire had been to possess the alp of his neighbor, now deceased, as by it his property would be rounded off to his satisfaction. Quickly making his resolution, he declared to the dismayed woman that the alp belonged to him. 
Her husband had secretly pledged it to him in return for a loan after the bad harvest of the previous year. When the widow angrily accused him of being a liar, the man produced a promissory note, spread it out, and with a hard laugh showed her his statement was confirmed in black and white. The distressed woman burst into tears and declared it was impossible that her late husband should have made a secret transaction of such a nature. The Alp was the sole inheritance of their son, and never would she willingly surrender it. I will pay you the compensation for the renunciation of your claim, although nothing obliges me to do so, declared the visitor with apparent compassion, in the meantime producing his purse. The weeping woman mentioned to him to put back his gold and told him to go, which he did. Three days later, the widow was summoned before the judge. There, the neighbor produced his document and repeated his demand for the possession of the disputed Alp. The judge, who was shamefully bribed, declared the document valid and awarded the Alp to the pursuer. The broken-hearted widow staggered home. The new possessor of the Alp, on the other hand, hastened up to the mountains at full gallop. The man could no longer master his impatience to see, for the first time as his legally recognized property, the pasture land he had acquired by deceit. There, for three days, a storm had raged uninterruptedly. As quickly as the soaked ways would permit, he ascended to the high country. Having arrived, he stared around with horrified eyes and fell in a swoon to the earth, overcome with consternation. Upon the soft green alp an unseen hand had rolled a mountain of ice. Of the possession which the unjust judge had assigned to him, nothing was now to be seen. His own pastures, too, which adjoined, were covered with snow and ice, whilst the meadows of the other alpsmen below lay spread out in the morning light like a velvet carpet. Towards noon a broken man rode home into the valley, cursing himself and the wicked magistrate who had consented to such an evil transaction. The people there, however, said to each other, The Fromfasten Mutelai, the little mother of the Ember Weeks, Frau Slaga, passed over our valley last night with her train of maidens, over the house of that greedy rich man the ghostly company stopped, and by that it is fixed which one must die in the course of the year. And so it happened. Up there, where the youthful Rhine rushes down through deep rocky chasms, the petrified Alp stands to this day. A silent warning from bygone days. The Domlesk Valley was formerly the scene of bitter feuds and is mentioned in the struggle for freedom by the Swiss peasants of the ancient Bund, some five hundred years ago. There stood the castle of the Hohenretzier. The last descendant of the degenerate race on the High Rails was rightly feared in the whole district. He was the terror of the peaceful inhabitants of the district, and harried not only them, but also merchants and pilgrims who passed along the highway below. The wrath against this unchivalrous wickedness increased mightily. One day this man perpetuated a daring deed of violence. Whilst on an excursion into the valley he had discovered a charming maid who sought berries in a lonely wood. In his wicked eagerness, he dragged the maiden on to his horse and fled. Amusing himself with her lamentations, he carried his booty up the steep castle hill. A poacher had observed the occurrence and alarmed the inhabitants of the village. They carried the intelligence without delay into the Domleshk. The oppressed people around then rose and joining together approached the castle that very night. Having felled giant trees, they threw a bridge over the moat, cast firebrands into the interior, and stormed into the castle yard through gaps in the gates and walls. Then the old baron appeared mounted on his war horse, driven out of his abode by tongues of flame. Before him he held the captured maiden, and in the light of the conflagration his naked sword glittered in his right hand. Dealing mighty blows on both sides, he forced his horse forward, the eyes of which had been bound, intending to make a way down the hill, but the living wall of peasants was impenetrable. Quickly making his resolution, the knight rushed to the side, where the wall of rock fell some seven hundred feet sheer into the youthful Rhine. The foaming steed stood trembling in front of the yawning abyss. The shout of the multitude echoed into the night. Thousands of arms were instantly stretched towards the river, and one of them at the last moment succeeded in snatching his prey from the robber 
just as the steed, tortured and bleeding from sword and spur, hurled himself with a mighty spring into the depths below. So ended the last of the Hornratiers. In the dawn, only the smoking ruins of the proud castle remained, and the morning bells announced to the peasants that their long-desired freedom had been won. These ruins are situated on the hinter Rhine above Thusis, and it is said that the last Hornratier, like many others of the former tyrants of the Ratigu, yearly on St. John's Eve, when this event occurred, may be seen riding around the fallen walls of his castle, clad in black armor, which emits glowing sparks. For many hundreds of years, the names of the masters of Bodmin have been very closely connected with the island in the Lake of Boden. At first, the island was in the possession of this noble race, but later on, in the 13th century, it passed into the hands of an order of German knights. A legend relates the story to us of how this change came to pass. About this time, the whole of this magnificent property was held in possession by a youthful maiden who had inherited this beautiful island with all its many charms. As may be supposed, the wooers for the lovely maiden's hand and inheritance became very numerous. She, however, had made her own choice, and it had fallen upon a nobleman from Langenstein. Every evening, when the sun was sinking down into the golden waters, this maiden walked along the strand, watching and listening for some longed-for sound. Then the measured splash of an oar would be heard approaching in the twilight, and a little boat would be drawn up on the shore. A youthful boatman would spring joyfully forth and lovingly greet the maiden. There this pair of lovers wove dreams about the time from which only a short period now separated them, when they should belong openly to each other before the world. The nobleman landed one evening, as usual, but this time his heart was depressed and sorrowful. He informed his betrothed mournfully that his father, who was then suffering agony from gout, had once taken a vow to God and to the emperor that he would go on a crusade to the Holy Land, but, being unable to fulfill the oath, he laid it to his son's charge to carry it out as he meant to have done. The maiden, wept bitterly on hearing these unexpected tidings. Trust me, and the powers on high, I shall not make this great sacrifice in vain, said her lover consolingly. I shall return, that I feel confident of. Thus, with bright hopes in his heart, the youthful crusader bade his weeping betrothed goodbye. And every evening, when the sun was sinking into the golden waters, the maiden walked along the strand, looking with longing eyes out into the misty distance. Spring came and disappeared. Summer followed, and the swallows fled from the lake to warmer climes, the maiden sending many a warm greeting with them. Wintry storms blew over the waters, whistling round the lonely island, and the maiden had become as pale as the flakes of snow which fell against the window panes. News one day reached the castle that the crusaders had returned from the east, but that the nobleman from Langenstein was languishing in a Turkish prison in a remote castle belonging to the sultan. The maiden was heartbroken by these tidings and now spent her days in prayers and tears. Within the mighty walls of a gloomy castle in the far-off east, a young hero was sitting pining over his bitter fate. He prayed and groaned aloud in his grief, thinking of his betrothed from whom he had been so cruelly separated. The sultan had offered the fair-haired youth his favorite daughter, a seductive eastern beauty, but the prisoner had turned scornfully away, her dark glancing eyes having no charm for him. That night, the youth had a strange dream. An angel was soaring over his couch and came down to his side, and a voice whispered, Promise yourself to me and you will see your native land again. The knight started up and said reverently, That was the voice of God. Confused thoughts rushed through his soul. He must renounce his love, but at least he would see her again. Throwing himself on his knees, he promised with a fervent oath that he would dedicate himself to the Lord, if only he might see the beloved maiden once more. An earthquake shook the castle to its very foundations, unfastening the prison doors, thus setting the prisoner at liberty in a marvelous way. 
He succeeded in reaching the coast without being caught by the guards of the Sultan, and a vessel sailing to Venice took him on board. But as he approached his native land, the struggle in his soul between love and duty was very great. At one moment it seemed to overcome him, and he felt he could no longer keep his vow. But God again admonished him. Reaching the lake, he steered his boat toward the island, but a sudden storm arose, threatening him with a watery grave. He prayed fervently to heaven, again swearing his oath. The storm subsided, and the little boat, having missed its course, landed on the other side of the lake, where the grand master of an order of German knights had his seat. The tired wayfarer approached, begging to be received, a boon kindly granted to him. Then starting off again with his boat, the youth reached the island. There he imprinted a sorrowful kiss on his beloved's pure white forehead, bidding her and the world goodbye forever. The young girl resigned herself at first silently to her fate, but she soon resolved on another plan. This place, which had once been such a happy home, had no longer any charms to offer her, and she therefore presented the island of Maynau to the German order of knights on one condition, that the nobleman from Langenstein should be the successor of the Grand Master. This request was willingly granted, and the noble maiden gave up all her rich possession and left the island in the Bowden Sea. It is said that she retired to a convent, but no one ever knew where. The chronicle informs us that Hugh of Langenstein became one of the most capable Grand Masters of this Order of the Knights of Maynau. He is also known as a great poet, and his poem on the martyr Martina still exists in old manuscripts. Basil was once surrounded by enemies, and very hard-pressed on all sides. A troop of discontented citizens made a shameful compact with the besiegers to help them to conquer the town. It was arranged one dark night that exactly as the clock was striking twelve the attack was to be made from within and without. The traders were all ready, waiting for midnight with great excitement, having no evil presentiments of what was about to happen. The expected hour approached. Accidentally, the watchman of the tower heard of the proposed attack, and no time being left to warn the commander of the garrison or the guard, he quickly and with great presence of mind determined upon safe expedience. He put forward the hand of the great clock one hour, so that instead of striking midnight, the clock struck one. The traders in the town looked at each other aghast, believing the enemies outside had neglected or perhaps betrayed them. General doubt and misunderstanding reigned in both camps. While they were debating what plan they must now adopt, the sharp-witted watchman had time to communicate with the magistrate and with the governor of the town. The alarm was raised, the citizens warned, and the treacherous plan completely wrecked. The enemy at last, tired of the useless siege, retired, discouraged. The magistrate, in remembrance of the remarkable deed, ordered that the town clock should remain in advance as the courageous watchman had said it that eventful night. This singular regulation continued till the year 1798, and although the honest inhabitants of Basel were, as talkative tongues asserted, a century behind hand in everything else, yet with regard to time, they were always one hour in advance. In olden times, a race of giants is said to have lived in Alsace. Castle Nidek, in the valley of Brush, was their residence, but even the ruins of this fortress have long since disappeared. The legend, however, remains to tell us that they were a peaceable people, well disposed to mankind. The daughter of the master of the castle was one day leisurely walking through the adjoining wood. On approaching the fields and meadows of the valley, she perceived a peasant ploughing. The young giantess looked in great astonishment at the tiny man who seemed to be so busily engaged, trudging along after his little team and turning up the ground with his small iron instrument. She had never before seen anything so wonderful, and was very much amused at the sight. It seemed to her a nice little toy, 
and she clapped her hands in childish glee so that the echo sounded among the mountains. Then, picking up man, horse, and plow, she placed them in her apron and hurried gaily back to the castle. There, she showed her father the nice little toy, greatly pleased at what she had found. The giant, however, shook his enormous head gravely and said in a displeased tone, Don't you know, child, who this trembling little creature with this struggling tiny animal is that you have chosen for a plaything? Of all the dwarfs down in the valley below, he is the most useful. He works hard and indefatigably in scorching heat, as well as in windy cold weather, so that the fields may produce fruit for us. He who scoffs at or maltreats him will be punished by heaven. Take the little laborer, therefore, back to the place he came from. The young giantess, greatly ashamed and deeply blushing with embarrassment, put the amusing little toy back into her apron and carried it obediently down to the valley. The cathedral was finished, and the city magistrates resolved to place an ingenious clock on the upper tower. For a long time they searched in vain, but at last a master was found who offered to create a work of art such as had never been seen in any land. The members of the council were highly satisfied with this proposal, and the master began his work. Weeks and months passed, and when at last it was finished, there was general astonishment. The clock was indeed so wonderful that nothing to match it could be found in the whole country. It marked not only the hours, but the days and months as well. A globe was attached to it, which also marked out the rising and the setting of the sun, and the eclipses of that body and the moon could be seen at the same time as they took place in nature. Every change was pointed out by Mercury's wand, and every constellation appeared at the right time. Shortly before the stroke of the clock, a figure representing death emerged from the center and sounded the full hour, while at the quarter and half hours the statue of Christ came forth, repelling the destroyer of all life. Added to all these wonders was a beautiful chime that played melodious hymns. Such was the marvelous clock in the Cathedral of Strasbourg. The magistrates, however, proved themselves unworthy of their new possession. Pride and presumption got the better of them, making them commit a most unjust and ungrateful action. They desired their town to be the only one in the land which possessed such a work of art, and in order to prevent the maker from making another like it, they did not shrink from the vilest of crimes. Taking advantage of the rumor that such a wonderful work could only have been made by the aid of witchcraft, they accused the clockmaker of being united with the devil, threw him into prison, and cruelly condemned him to be blinded. The unhappy artist resigned himself to his bitter fate without a murmur. The only favor he asked was that he be allowed to examine the clock once again before the judgment was carried out. He said he wanted to arrange something in the works which no one else could understand. The crafty magistrates, being anxious to have the clock perfect, granted him this request. The artist filed, sawed, regulated here and there, and then was led away, and in the same hour deprived of his sight. The cruel deed was hardly accomplished when it was found that the clock had stopped. The artist had destroyed his work with his own hands. His righteous determination that the chimes would never ring again had become a melancholy truth. Up to the present, no one has been able to set the dead works going. An equally splendid clock now adorns the cathedral, but the remains of the first one have been preserved ever since. Close to the famous clock in the Cathedral of Strasbourg, there is a little man in stone gazing up at the angel's pillar which supports the south wing of the cathedral. Long ago, the little man who is now sculpted in stone stood there in flesh and blood. He used to stare up at the pillar with a criticizing eye from top to bottom and again from bottom to top. Then he would shake his head doubtfully each time. It happened once that a sculptor passed the cathedral and saw the little man looking up, evidently comparing the proportions of the pillar, 
It seems to me that you are finding fault with the pillar, my good fellow, the stone cutter remarked, and the little man nodded with a self satisfied look. Well, what do you think of it? Speak out, my man, said the master, tapping the fellow's shoulder encouragingly. The pillar is certainly splendid, began the latter slowly. The apostles, the angels, and the Savior are most beautiful, too. But there is one thing troubling me. That slender pillar cannot support that heavy vault much longer. It will soon totter and fall down, and all will go to pieces. The sculptor looked alternately at the work of art and its strange fault-finder. A contemptuous smile passed over his features. You are quite convinced of the truth of your statement, aren't you? He asked inquiringly. The bold critic repeated his doubts with an important air. Well, cried the stone cutter with comical earnestness, then you'll remain there always, gazing at the pillar until it sinks down, crushed by the vaults. He went straight off to his workshop seized hammer and chisel, and formed the little man into stone just as he was, looking upwards with a knowing face and an important air. This little figure is still there at the present day, with both hands leaning on the balustrade of St. Nicholas's Chapel, awaiting the expected fall of the pillar, and most likely he will remain there for many a century to come. Today we are deeply touched, as our forefathers must have been, at the recital of the boundless suffering and the overwhelming concatenation of sin and expiation in the lives of the Reckon and the Frauen of the Nibelungen legend. That naive singer has remained nameless and unknown, who about the end of the twelfth century wrote down this legend in poetic form, thus preserving forever our most precious relic of Germanic folks epic. A powerful story it is of sin and suffering corresponding to the world itself and just as the primitive mind of a people loves to represent it. The story begins as a lovely idyll, but ends in gloomy tragedy. The ancient Rhenish town of Worms was, during the great migrations, the seat of authority of the Burgundian invaders and East Germanic stock. During the glorious reign of King Gunther, there appears, attracted by the beauty of Kriemhild, the king's sister, a young hero, Siegfried by name. He is himself a king's son, his father, Sigmund, reigning in Xanten, Nieden by dem Rhein. King Gunther receives the fair Reckon into his service as a vassal. Siegfried, exhibiting the fairest loyalty to his overlord and rendered invisible by magic, conquers for him the redoubtable Brunhild, the proud queen of the island kingdom of Iceland, Iceland, and compels her to wed King Gunther. As a reward, Siegfried receives the hand of Kriemhild. In the fullness of his heart, the hero presents to Kriemhild as a marriage gift the Nibelungen hoard, which he had gained in his early years from the sons of the king of the Nibelungen and from dwarf Albrecht, the guardian of the treasure. Joy reigns in the king's court at Worms, but it was not shared by all. Besides Kriemhild, there was another secretly drawn towards the hero, and in Brunhild's heart the bridal happiness of Kriemhild awakens such envy that soon no friendly word passes between the women. They become estranged, and one day her bad feeling leads Brunhild to harsh words. Then, alas, Kriemhild gives unbridled license to her tongue. In her rash insolence, she represents to Brunhild that it was not Gunther but Siegfried who formerly overcame her. As proof of this, she produces the ring and girdle which Siegfried had taken on that night from the powerful Brunhild, which he had presented to Kriemhild. With fierce haughtiness, Kriemhild taunts her opponent with a hateful name no woman could endure and forbids her to enter the cathedral. Brunhild, weeping, informs King Gunther of the contumely heaped upon her. The king is filled with wrath, and his vassal, the gloomy Hagen, considers how he may destroy Siegfried avowedly to avenge the queen, but secretly for the possession of the Nibelungen horde. During a hunt in the Odenwald, Siegfried was treacherously stabbed by Hagen, whilst stopping to drink from a well. 
The intention was to spread the report that Siegfried had been slain by robbers whilst hunting alone. So on the following day, they crossed the Rhine back to Worms. In the night, Hagen caused the dead body of Siegfried to be laid in front of Kriemhild's chamber. In the early morning, as Kriemhild, accompanied by her attendants, was preparing to go to Mass in the cathedral, she noticed the corpse of her hero. A wail of sorrow arose. Kriemhild threw herself weeping on the body of her murdered husband. Alas, she cried, thy shield is not hewn by swords, thou hast been foully murdered. Did I but know who has done this, I would avenge thy death. Kriemhild ordered a magnificent bier for her royal hero, and demanded that an ordeal should be held over the corpse. For it is a marvellous thing, and to this day it happens, that when the blood-stained murderer approaches, wounds bleed anew. So all the princes and nobles of Burgundy walked past the dead body, above which was the figure of the crucified Redeemer of the world, and lo, when the grim Hagen came forward, the wounds of the dead man began to flow. In the presence of the astounded men and horrified women, Grimhild accused Hagen of the assassination of her husband. Much treachery and woe accompany the expiation of this great crime. The Nibelungen horde, the cause of the shameful deed, was sunk in the middle of the Rhine in order to prevent future strife arising from human greed. But Kriemhild's undying sorrow was not mitigated, nor her unconquerable thirst for revenge appeased. After the burial of his son, King Sigmund begged in vain that Kriemhild should come to the royal city of Xanten. She remained at Worms for thirteen years, constantly near her beloved dead. Then the sorrowing woman removed to the Abbey of Lorch, which her mother, Frau Ute, had founded. Thither also she transferred Siegfried's body. When Etzel, Attila, the ruler of the Huns, wooed her, Kriemhild, urged not by love but by very different feelings, gave him her hand and accompanied her heathen lord to the Ungerland. Then she treacherously invited Siegfried's murderers to visit her husband, and prepared for them a destruction which fills the mind with horror. The Burgundian king and his followers, who, since the horde had come into their possession, were called the Nibelungen, fell slaughtered in the Etzelberg under the swords of the Huns and their allies. Thus, atoning for their faithlessness to the hero Siegfried. And with this awful holocaust ends the light of the Nibelungenot, the most renowned heroic legend in the German tongue. The German emperor Henry IV had much trouble to bear under his purple mantle. Through his own and through strangers' faults, the crown which he wore was set with thorns, and even into the bosom of his family this unhappy spirit of dissension had crept. The excommunication of the Pope, his powerful enemy, was followed by the revolt of the princes, and lastly by the conspiracy of his own sons. His eldest son, Conrad, openly rebelled against him and treated his father most scornfully. When this prince died suddenly, the second son, Henry, attempted the deposition of his father and made intrigues against him. Thus, forced to abdicate his throne, the broken-down emperor fled to Liège, accompanied by one faithful servant, Kurt, and there lay down to his last rest. His body was left for five years in unconsecrated ground in a foreign country. Kurt remained faithful and prayed incessantly at the burial place of his royal master. At last, the Pope, at Henry's request, consented to recall the ban. Henry ordered his father's remains to be brought to Speyer and solemnly interred with the royal family. Kurt was allowed to follow the procession to Speyer, but wearied out by this long watching, the old man died a few days afterwards. Just at the moment of his death, the bells in the cathedral at Speyer tolled without any human hand putting them in motion, as they always did when an imperial death took place. Years passed. The German emperor Henry V lay dying on his luxurious couch at Speyer. His bodily sufferings were intense, but the agony of his mind was even greater. He had obtained the crown which now pressed so heavily on his head by shameful, treacherous means. The apparition of his father dying in misery appeared to him, and no words of the flatterers at his bedside could still the voice of his conscience. 
At last, death freed him from all his torments. And at the same hour, the bells which were always rung when a poor sinner was led to execution tolled, set in motion by no human hand. Thus were the bells the instrument of that hand which wisely and warningly wrote, Honor thy father and thy mother. The emperor was to be crowned at Frankfurt, and great festivities were to be given in the town in his honor, among them a masquerade, at which knights and noble ladies rivaled each other in splendor. Joy was depicted on every face at this great assembly, only one knight among the many guests being noticeable for his gravity and restraint. He wore black armor, and the feather waving above his visor was black too. No one knew him or could guess who he was. He approached the empress with a noble grace, bent his knee, and asked her to dance with him, which she graciously consented to do. He glided gracefully through the splendid halls with the queen of the festival, and soon every eye was turned on them, and everyone was eager to know who he was. The empress was charmed with her excellent partner, and the grace of his refined conversation pleased her so much that she granted him a second and a third dance. Everyone became more and more curious to know who this masked knight was. Meanwhile, the hour struck when every mask had to be raised, and every masked guest must make himself known. More than all the others, the empress was anxious to know who her partner was. But he hesitated, and even refused to take off his mask until she ordered him peremptorily to do so. The knight obeyed, but none of the high ladies or noble knights recognized him. Suddenly, two stewards pressed through the crowd, crying with indignation and horror, It's the headsman from Bergen! Then, the emperor, in great wrath, ordered the shameful offender who had thus degraded the empress and insulted his sovereign to be led to execution. But the culprit, throwing himself at the emperor's feet, said boldly, I have transgressed, my lord, and offended you and your noble guests, but most heavily have I sinned against my queen. No punishment, not even blood, will be able to wash out the disgrace you have suffered through me. Therefore, O king, allow me to propose a remedy to efface the shame. Draw your sword and knight me, and I will throw down my gauntlet to anyone who dares to speak disrespectfully of my sovereign. The emperor was taken by surprise at this bold proposal. However, it appeared the wisest plan to adopt. You are a knave, he replied after a moment's consideration, but your advice is good and displays prudence, just as your offense shows adventurous courage. Well then, laying his sword on the man's neck. Rise, sir knight. You have acted like a knave, and the knave of Bergen you shall be called henceforth. A joyful shout of approbation pealed through the halls, and the new knight again glided gracefully through the crowd with the queen of the festival. The priest or, as some say, Canon, in the old town of Mainz was a very worthy man, and at the same time a heaven-gifted singer. Besides devoting himself to science, he composed numerous pious verses which he dedicated to the Holy Virgin. He also played the harp and wrote many beautiful songs in honor of the female sex. In contrast to many contemporary poets, he considered woman a higher title than wife, which only signifies a married woman. So, on account of the chivalry displayed in his numberless poems and songs, posterity gave him the name of Frauenlob, under which title he is better known than under his own name of Heinrich of Meissen. The love and veneration which thankful women paid him was very great, not only during his lifetime, but even more so after his death. Their grief was intense when it became known that the poet's voice would never more be heard in this world. It was agreed to honor him with such a burial as no poet had ever before received. The funeral procession moved slowly and sorrowfully along the streets, 
the greater part of the cortege being women in deep mourning who prayed for the repose of the poet's soul. Eight of the most beautiful among them carried the coffin which was covered with sweet-scented flowers. At the grave songs of lamentation were heard from women's gentle voices. Precious Rhine wine, which had been the poet's favorite drink, and which so often had inspired his poetry, was poured by hands of his admirers over his grave, so profusely, the legend relates, that the entrance of the church was flooded by the libation. But still more precious than all these gifts were the tears, which on this memorable day were shed by many a gentle lady. The wanderer can still see the monument erected to this great benefactor in the cathedral at Mainz, which represents the figure of a beautiful woman, in pure white marble, placing a wreath on the coffin of the great singer, who had honored women in the most chivalrous of songs. In the year 1000, there was a very pious priest in Mainz called Bishop Villigus. He was the only son of a poor wheelwright, but by his perseverance and his own merit, he had attained to the dignity of first priest of the kingdom. The honest citizens of Mainz loved and honored the worthy divine, although they did not altogether like having to bow down to one who had been brought up in a simple cottage like themselves. The bishop once reproved them in gentle tones for thinking too much of mere dissent. This vexed the supercilious citizens, and one night they determined to play Villigus a trick. They took some chalk and drew enormous wheels on all the doors of his house. Early next morning, as the bishop was going to Mass, he noticed the scoffer's malicious work. He stood silently looking at the wheels, the chaplain by his side, expecting every moment that the reverend prelate would burst forth in a terrible rage. But a gay smile spread over the bishop's features, and, ordering a painter to be sent to him, he told him to paint white wheels on a scarlet background, visible to every eye, just where the chalk wheels had been drawn, and underneath to paint the words, Villigus, Villigus, just think what you have risen from. But he did not stop there. He ordered the wheelwrights to make him a plow wheel and caused it to be placed over his couch in memory of his extraction. Thereafter, the scoffers were put to silence, and the people of Mainz began to honor and esteem their worthy bishop, who, though he had been so exalted, possessed such honest common sense. White wheels on a red ground have been the arms of the bishops of Mainz ever since. Wherever the German tongue is heard, and even further still, the king of all Rhine wines, Johannesburger, is known and sought after. Every friend of the grape which grows on the banks of this river is well acquainted with it, but few perhaps know of its princely origin. It is princely not because prince's hands once kept the key to Johannesburg, but rather because princely hands planted the vine in the Rhine country and this royal giver was no other than Charlemagne, the all-powerful ruler of the kingdom of the Franks. Once, in early spring, Charles the Great was standing on the balcony of his castle at Ingelheim, his eyes straying over the beautiful stretch of country at his feet. Snow had fallen during the night, and the hills of Rudesheim were clothed in white. As the imperial ruler was looking thoughtfully over the landscape, he noticed that the snow on one side of Johannesburg melted quicker in the sun's rays than on any other part. Charles, who was a great and deep thinker, began to reflect that, on a spot where the rays of the sun shone so genially, something better than grass would thrive. Sending for Kunrat his faithful servant, he bade him saddle his horse the next day at dawn and ride to Orleans a town famous for its good wine. He was to inform the citizens that the emperor had not forgotten the excellent wine that they had given him there, and that he would like to grow the same vines on the Rhine. He desired the citizens of Orleans, therefore, to send him plants from their country. The messenger set off to do the king's bidding, and ere the moon had again gone round her course, was back in the castle at Ingelheim. Great satisfaction prevailed at court. 
Charles, mighty ruler that he was, even went so far as to cross the Rudesheim, where he planted with his royal hand the French vine in German soil. This was no mere passing whim on the part of the emperor. He sent messengers constantly to bring word how the vines were thriving at Rudesheim and on the flanks of Johannesburg, and, when the third autumn had come round, the emperor Charlemagne set out from his favorite resort, Aix-la-Chapelle, for the Rhine country, and great rejoicing prevailed among the vine-reapers from Rudesheim to Johannesburg. The first cup of wine was solemnly offered to the emperor, a golden wine in a golden goblet, a wine worthy of a king. Charles took a long, deep draught, and, with brightened eyes, praised the delicious drink. It became his favorite wine, this fiery Johannesburger, making him young again in his old age. What Charlemagne then felt when he drank this wine, everyone who raises the sparkling grape juice to his lips is keenly sensible of also. Wherever the German tongue is heard, and even further still, the king of all Rhine wines is known and sought after, Johannesburger wine. The legend weaves another wonderful tale about the great emperor blessing his grapes. A poet's pen has fashioned it into a song which is still often heard among the grape-gatherers. Every spring, when the vines are blossoming on the hills and in the valleys along the river, and their fragrance scents the air, a tall shadow wanders about the vineyards at night, a purple mantle hanging from his stately shoulders and a crown on his head. It is Charlemagne, the great emperor, who planted the grapes long years before. The luscious scent of the blossoms wakens him from his tomb in Aix-la-Chapelle, and he comes to bless the grapes. When the full moon gently casts her bright beams on the water, lighting up the emperor's nightly path, he may be seen crossing the golden bridge formed by her rays and then wandering further along the hills, blessing the vines on the other side of the river. At the first crow of the cock he returns to his grave in Aix-la-Chapelle, and sleeps till the scent of the grapes awakens him next spring, when he again wanders through the countries along the Rhine, blessing the vineyards. Let us now relate another little story which is told of the monks who lived at Johannesburg. Once the high abbot of Fulda came unexpectedly to visit the cloister at Johannesburg just about the time when the grapes were ripe. The worthy abbot had made inquiries about his people and showed himself highly pleased with the works of the industrious monks and, as a mark of his continued favor, invited all the inmates of the cloister to a drinking bout. Wine maketh the heart glad. Thus quoting King David's significant words, the holy man began his speech. God's loving hand will be gracious in future years to your vines. Let us profit by his grace, brothers, and drink what he has provided for us in moderation and reverence. But before we refresh ourselves with God's good gifts, take your breviaries and let us begin with a short prayer. Breviaries? was whispered along the rows, and the eyes of the fat genial faces blinked in helpless embarrassment. Yes, your breviaries said the white-haired abbot, looking silently but sternly at the brothers. They searched and searched. Gradually the frown disappeared from the abbot's face, and a smile gradually spread over his withered features. Well, never mind, let us drink, he said. Then, feeling his pockets, he said with a gleam in his eye, That's too bad. I ought to have brought a corkscrew with me when I came to the Rhine. A corkscrew! Everyone dives his hand into his pocket, and as many corkscrews were produced before the worthy abbot as there were brothers present. Then a gleam of merriment beamed in the abbot's eyes. Bravo, ye pious monks, what a plentiful supply of corkscrews! Do not all look so embarrassed, we shall not be annoyed about it today, but tomorrow, now, we shall sing with King David, Wine maketh the heart glad and the uncorked bottle went the rounds. The story which we have now to relate is a very touching one, and it becomes even more interesting when we know that it is based on real fact. 
In the little town of Ingelheim, there was a beautiful marble castle, the favorite residence of Charlemagne. He often retired to this lonely, peaceful spot, accompanied only by a few of his faithful vassals and the members of his own family. Eigenhard, the emperor's private secretary, was never missing from this little circle. Charlemagne thought highly of this man, then in the prime of youth, on account of his profound knowledge and extraordinary talents. The young scholar, so different from the wise counselors not only in his learning but in his cultivated manners, was a great favorite among the ladies of the court. Eigenhard, who was a constant companion of the emperor, had also become an intimate member of the family circle, and Charlemagne entrusted him with the education of his favorite child, Emma, daughter of his wife, Gismonda. The dark-eyed maiden was considered the most beautiful of her age, and the young scholar could not remain cold and indifferent to her charms. The undisturbed hours, which should have been spent in learning, led to a mutual understanding. Eigenhard struggled to remind himself of his duty toward his sovereign, but love overcame him, and soon an oath of eternal fidelity united these young hearts. The great emperor ought to have known what would be the consequence of allowing the young scholar to enjoy the society of his dark-eyed, passionate daughter. In the still hours of the night, when all the inmates of the castle lay wrapped in sleep, Eigenhard sought the chamber of his beloved. She listened enchanted to the glowing words of his burning heart, but their love was chaste and pure, no gusts of passion troubling them. But fate was against these lovers. One night they were sitting in Emma's chamber talking confidentially together. The great palace was veiled in darkness, no ray of light, no star was to be seen in the heavens. As Eigenhard was about to leave the chamber, he perceived that the courtyard below was covered with snow. It would have been impossible to pass across it without leaving a trace behind him, but at all risks he must reach his room. What was to be done? Love is ingenious. After considering for some time together, they both concluded that there was but one way to prevent their being betrayed. The slender maiden took her lover on her back and carried him across the courtyard, thus leaving behind only her two small footprints. It happened that Charles the Great had not yet sought the repose he needed so much as care banished sleep from his eyes. He sat at his window and looked out into the silent night. In the courtyard below, he perceived a shadow crossing the pavement, and, looking carefully, he recognized his favorite daughter, Emma, carrying a man on her back. Yes, and this man was Eigenhard, his great favorite. Pain and anger struggled in his heart. He wanted to rush down and kill him, an emperor's daughter and a mere secretary. But with a great effort he restrained himself, mastered the violent agitation which this unexpected sight caused him, and went back to his chamber to wait wearily for dawn. The next day Charles assembled his counselors. They were all horrified to see his ghastly look. His brow was dark and sorrow was depicted on every feature. Eigenhard looked at his master, apprehending coming evil. Charlemagne stood up and spake. What does a royal princess deserve who receives the visit of a man at night? The counselors looked at each other speechless. Eigenhard's countenance became white as death. The counselors soon guessed the name of the royal princess, and they consulted together for some time, not knowing what to say. But at last, one counselor answered, Your Majesty, we think that a weak woman must not be punished for anything done out of love. And what does a favorite of the emperor deserve who creeps into a royal princess's chamber at night? Charlemagne cast a dark look at his secretary, who trembled and became even paler. Alas! All is lost, murmured he to himself. Then, raising his voice, he said, Death, my master and emperor. Charles looked at the young man full of astonishment. The wrath in his soul melted at this self-accusation and fervent repentance. Deep silence followed this answer, and in a few minutes the emperor dismissed his counselors, making a sign at the same time to Eigenhard to follow him. Without a word, Charles led him into his private chamber, where, in answer to his summons, Emma appeared. 
Her heart misgave her as she saw the dark look on her father's face and the troubled features of her beloved. She understood all at once, and with a convulsive cry of pain threw herself at her father's feet. Mercy, mercy, my father, we love each other so dearly, murmured she, raising her large eyes imploringly. Mercy, murmured Eigenhard too, bending his knees. The emperor remained silent. After a time he began to speak earnestly and coldly at first, but his voice changed to a milder tone on hearing the sobs of his favorite child. I shall not separate you who are bound to each other by love. A priest shall unite you, and at dawn tomorrow you must both be gone from the castle, never to return. He left them, shutting the door behind him. The beautiful maiden sank down on her knees, only half conscious in her grief of what her father had said. But Eigenhard's soft voice soon whispered in her ear, Do not weep, Emma. By thrusting you from him, your father, my master, has only bound us together forever. Come, he continued in a trembling voice, alarmed at her passionate tears. We must go, but love will ever be with us. The next day, two pilgrims left the castle of Ingelheim, and took the road in the direction of Mainz. Time wore on. Charles the Great had made war on Saxony, and had set the Roman crown upon his own head, and had become famous throughout the whole world. But all his fame had not prevented his hair from becoming grey, nor his heart from being sad. A mournful picture had imprinted itself on his mind, despite all his efforts to forget the past. In the evening, when the setting sun glittered on the marble pillars of the royal palace, casting its golden rays into the chamber of the great emperor, it would find him sitting motionless in his carved oak chair, his gray head buried in his hands, mournful dreams troubling his peace. He was thinking of the days which were past, of the young man whose gentle ways made him so different from the rough warriors of the court how he used to recite poetry and sing the songs of the old bard so passionately, and the old legends which the emperor prized so much, how he used to read to him from the old grey parchment which he, Eigenhard, had written so carefully, how his own favorite dark-eyed daughter had so often been present, sitting at his feet, listening intently to the reader. All this came back to his memory, saddening his heart and filling his eyes with tears. Bugle horns sounded through the forest. Charles and his followers were at the chase. The old emperor, seeking to forget his grief, had seized his spear and gone out to hunt. In his eagerness to follow a magnificent stag, he had become separated from his escort. The sun was already low in the west. The animal, now seeing no way of escape as his pursuer was close behind him, dashed into a river and swam to the other side. The emperor, in hot pursuit and much exhausted, arrived at the water's edge and for the first time noticed that he was alone, and in a part of the country quite unknown to him. The river lay before him and the forest behind, but the latter seemed to be quite impenetrable. It was already night, and Charles sought in vain to find some path or track. As he was looking round him, he perceived a light in the distance. Greatly pleased, he started off in that direction, and found a little hut close to the river, but on looking through the window, Charlemagne saw the room was a very poor one. Perhaps this is the hermitage of some pious man, thought he, and knocked at the door, whereupon a fair-haired man appeared on the threshold. Without mentioning his name, the emperor informed him of what had happened and begged shelter for the night. At the sound of this loved voice, the man trembled, but controlling himself, he invited the emperor to enter. A young woman was sitting on a stool, rocking a baby in her arms. She started, became very pale at the sight of the emperor, and then hurried into the next room to hide her emotion. Charles sat down, and refusing refreshment from his host, leaned his head wearily on his hands. Minutes passed, and still he sat there lost in thought, dreaming of those happy bygone days. At last... The sweet prattle of a child roused him, and he looked up he saw a little girl, about five years old at his side, stretching out her arms to him, bidding him good night. Charles looked closely at the little angel-like creature, his heart throbbing within him. 
What is your name, little one? asked he. Emma, answered the child. Emma, repeated Charles with tears in his eyes, and drawing the child closer to him, he pressed a kiss on its forehead. In a moment, the man and his young wife were at the emperor's feet imploring pardon. Emma, Eigenhard, cried he with great emotion, embracing them both. Blessed be the place where I have found you again. Emma and Eigenhard returned in great pomp to the emperor's court. The latter gave them his beautiful palace at Ingelheim, and only felt himself happy when he was with them. He caused a cloister to be built on the spot where he had found them again, which, to the present day, is called Zelligenstadt, Town of the Happy. In the church belonging to this little town, the tomb of Eigenhard and Emma is still shown, for according to their wishes, their bones were interred in the same coffin. In the lofty cathedral of Spires stood a great assemblage of knights, and on the throne near the altar sat Conrad der Stauff, with his hands resting on the hilt of his sword. All were listening intently to the burning words of Bernard of Clairvaux, who was describing the ruthless manner in which the holy places of Palestine had been laid waste. As the saintly preacher ended with a thrilling appeal to the religious feelings of his audience, a great shout, On to Jerusalem! rang through the sacred edifice. Most of the knights offered to bring as many followers as possible to aid their pious emperor. Among those present was Hans Bromser, the lord of the Niederberg at Rudesheim. This noble knight, the last of his race, was not detained at home by family cares. His wife had early been taken from him by death, and Mictildus, the only offspring of their marriage, was left under the protection of the neighboring Falkenstein family. So the pious warriors marched by devious and dangerous routes to that land where our Lord lived and suffered. In fierce battle with the Saccharins, many a noble knight closed his eyes for ever. Many met a harder fate, a living death in the noisome prisons of the unbelievers. After a lost battle, Sir Bromser fell into the hands of the Turks, and in a dungeon had to suffer shameful imprisonment. Sometimes they would force their knightly foe to turn a millstone while the crowd jeered. Then, in the hour of deepest misery, the knight made a vow to God. Give me my freedom again, and I vow that my child Mechtilda shall devote her life to the church. And he repeated the solemn words again, and yet a third time. Then happened what none of his companion in arms had ever hoped for. The brave crusader stormed this Turkish stronghold in the Syrian desert and liberated their fellow crusaders from captivity. Full of gratitude to God, Hans Bromser again fought valiantly in the holy cause. Meanwhile at home, in the hospitable keep above the Rhine, a maiden awaited with anxiety the return of her father. Often in the silent hours, with sweetness and sunshine around her, without and within, she stood on the castle wall, and she saw in reverie that blue eastern land, whilst she listened to the wild throbbing of her young heart in which the blossoms of first love were bursting. Then, one night, her father returned to the Rhineland. In the moss-covered courtyard of the castle, Mechtildis embraced her father long and silently. Beside the maiden, now in her seventeenth year, stood the young lord of Falkenstein. The youth bowed deeply to the lord of the Bromserberg, and greeted him kindly with the words, Welcome home, father. Then the vow made in the Syrian prison rose like a spectre to pall the joy of the crusader's return. In the banqueting hall of the castle a large company had assembled to celebrate the happy return of Hans Bromser and his faithful companions. The praise of the crusaders resounded and many stories were told of the dangers the heroes had encountered. With stirring words, the knight related to his listening guests how he himself had fought in the sacred cause, and how he had suffered imprisonment among the heathen. Then, in a lower tone and with solemn words, he told his friends of the vow he had made in his honor of deep despair in the Syrian dungeon. The painful silence which followed was broken by a stifled cry, and the knight's daughter, pale as the covering on the festive board, sank unconscious to the floor. 
With burning cheek and flashing eye, the young lord of Falkenstein arose, and, with a firm voice, exclaimed, Matilda's belongs to me. She has solemnly given herself to me for ever. The murmur soon subsided before the stern countenance of the lord of the castle. Mechtildis has been dedicated to heaven, not to you, boy. The last of the Bromser race has sworn it and abides by it. The knight said this with suppressed fury, and soon his guests departed in silence. Mechtildis lay in her chamber in wild grief. The flickering lamp beside the crucifix threw an unsteady light on the extended form of the maiden who was measuring the tedious night hours in the love anguish of her young heart. To the distracted maid, her chamber seemed to be transformed to an oppressive dungeon. Seizing the lamp with a trembling hand, she hurried up the narrow winding stair onto the roof of the castle, and there committed her great grief to the listening ear of night. Leaning on the wall, she looked away towards the castle where lived the noble young lord to whom she had dedicated her life. I am thine, my beloved, she sobbed. No star was visible in the sky. A wild autumn wind shrieked and swirled around the keep in accompaniment to the storm in the maiden's breast. A short, piercing cry echoed in the darkness. Was it the bride of the wind, or a human cry? The night swallowed it. From the parapet of the Bromserberg, a female form had been hurtled down into the dark floods of the Rhine below. A bright harvest morning followed a stormy night. In the Bromserberg they were searching everywhere in vain for their lord's daughter. Soon, however, a mournful procession approached, bearing the mortal remains of Mechtildis. In the early dawn a young woman had rescued the body from the waters of the river. Now. The walls of the Bromserberg echoed with sounds of woe over the early death of this last fair young flower of the Bromser race. Hans Bromser threw himself on the body and buried his stern features in the snowy linen. Not a tear bedewed his eyelids. As a preparatory offering for the rest of the soul of the maiden who had thus avoided the monastic life, the knight, in his deep sorrow, vowed to build a chapel on the hill opposite his castle. Then Hans Bromser shut himself in his chamber, and passed the following days in silent grief, while the grave closed over his wretched child. Many months passed, but still not a stone of the promised chapel had been set up. In the bitterness of his sorrow, the grief-stricken father had separated himself more and more from the world, and now brooded in gloomy isolation. One day a servant came before him with the likeness of the mother of God, which an ox had scraped up while plowing a field on the hill opposite of the castle, and three times the servant declared he had heard, Not Gottes, suffering of God, called out. Then Hans Bromser remembered his vow and the chapel for the peace of the soul of Mechtildis was erected. Not Gottes, it is called to this day. Below Bingen, in the middle of the Rhine, there is a lonely island on which a stronghold is to be seen. This tower is called the Mouse Tower. For many centuries a very gloomy tale has been told about it in connection with Hatto, Archbishop of Mainz whose evil deeds were well known throughout the country. Hato is said to have been ambitious, heartless, and perfidious, as well as cruel towards the poor. He extorted taxes from his people, tolls were imposed, and new burdens invented only to gratify his haughty pride and his love of display. On a little island between Bingen and Rudesheim, he caused a tower to be built so that all passing ships could be stopped in the narrow passage where they were obliged to pay a toll. Soon after the building of this custom house, there was a very bad harvest in the country round Mainz. Drought had parched the fields, and the little seed remaining had been destroyed by hail. The scarcity was felt all the more because the bishop had bought up all the stores of corn that were left from the year before, and had stored them up safely in his granaries. A terrible famine now threatened the land, spreading misery among the poor. The unhappy people implored the cruel bishop to lower the price of the corn in his storehouse, which he wished to sell at such exorbitant prices that his subjects could not buy it. All their petitions were in vain. 
His advisers besought him to have pity on the deplorable condition of the poor, but Haddo remained unmoved. When cries of distress and murmuring voices of the exasperated folk were raised against their hard-hearted master, the bishop gave free vent to the wicked thoughts of his soul. One day, a troop of hungry beggars came crowding to the episcopal palace, crying for food. Hatto and his guests were just sitting down to a luxurious banquet. The bishop had been talking to his companions of these wretched people and had expressed his opinion that it would be a good thing to do away with them altogether in some drastic way. As the ragged mob of men, women, and children with hollow cheeks and pale faces threw themselves at his feet crying for bread, a still more fiendish plan suggested itself. Beckoning to them with hypocritical kindness, he promised them corn and caused them to be led outside the town to a barn, where each one was to receive as much corn as he wished. The unhappy folk hurried forth, their hearts full of gratitude, but when they were all in the barn, Haddo ordered the doors to be locked and the barn to be set on fire. The screams of the poor wretches were heart-rending and could be heard even in the bishop's palace. But cruel Hatto cried out scornfully to his advisers, Listen, how the mice are squeaking among the corn. This eternal begging is at an end at last. May the mice bite me if it is not true. But the punishment which heaven sent him was terrible. Thousands of mice came out of the burning barn, made their way to the palace, filled every chamber and corner, and at last attacked the bishop himself. His servants killed them by hundreds, but their numbers seemed only to increase, as did their ferocity also. The bishop was seized with horror, and, anticipating God's punishment, he fled from the town and went on board a boat, hoping to defend himself from his terrible pursuers. But the innumerable horde swam in legions after him, and when he reached his tower on the island, thinking at last he would be safe there, the mice followed him gnawing the tower and tearing for themselves an entrance with their sharp teeth, till at last they reached him whom they sought. The cruel man was devoured by the mice, which attacked him by scores. In his despair he offered his soul to the evil one if he would release his body from such awful agony. The evil spirit came, freed his body, but took his soul away for himself. Thus runs the legend. History, however, speaks less severely of Hatto, the imperious prelate. His great ambition was his desire of power. He was the founder of the temporal power which the seat of Mainz obtained, and which later on made it the first bishopric of the kingdom. But he was always hated by the citizens who suffered much owing to his proud, despotic character. It is true that he was the founder of the toll which ships in olden times were obliged to pay on the Rhine, so that this fact and many other cruel exactions of his has helped to evolve the terrible legend of the Mouse Tower. Once upon a time in the high castle called Rheingraftstein, near Kreuznach, the flower of the knights belonging to the Rhine country were assembled. They were peaceful warriors, these nobles of ancient rank, but the most prominent among them was the host himself, the proud Rhine Count. Many a cup had he already emptied to the health of his distinguished guests, and rising up once more from his richly carved chair, he cast a look over the brilliant assembly and said in a boastful tone, I have got a knight's high boot here, my noble lords, a courier left it behind him once. Now I promise, on the honor of my house, that whoever will drink it empty at one draught to him, I will give the village of Hufelsheim yonder. The Count smiling at the novelty of the challenge, took the boot from his attendant's hand, caused it to be filled to the brim, and held up this novel cup to his guests. "'Tis a fair challenge. Come on, whoever will dare,' said he. Among the illustrious company present there was one, John of Sponheim, a knight well known in the country for his enormous drinking powers, but he remained unmoved at these defiant words, only looking inquiringly at his neighbor, Knight Weinhardt of Down, who in great perplexity was striving to hide his head behind a large goblet. Old Florsheimer, another knight whose thirst usually seemed unquenchable, stroked his grey beard doubtfully, while Kunz of Stromberg, a tall, thin man, shook his head at the thought of the after-effects which such a draught would bring. 
Even the chaplain of the castle, who attributed his effective intoning of high mass to the virtues of the Rhinish wine which he indulged in so freely, looked longingly at the boot, but had not the courage to attempt such a rash act. Suddenly a knight, booze of Waldeck by name, arose. He was a muscular man with the strength of a bear. In a voice of thunder he banged his mighty fist upon the table and said scornfully, Bring me that little boot. The distinguished company stared at him in great astonishment, but Booz of Waldeck, taking the boot in his sturdy fist, cried out, Your health, my lords! Then, flourishing it in the air, he emptied the boot at one draught. When this act was accomplished, Booz threw himself heavily into his chair, and addressing the master of the ceremonies, said with a humorous twinkle in his eye, Did the courier not leave the other boot too? I might possibly win a second bet, and thus acquire the village of Roxheim in the bargain. The Count looked much abashed, but his noble guests only laughed heartily at the joke. Thus, stout Booz of Waldeck became lord of the village of Hofersheim. The following legend tells us about the origin of Castle Sponheim in the village of Nye. Once a knight of Ravensburg was eagerly wooing the beautiful young Countess of Heimburg, but there was a serious obstacle in his path to success. Some years before, a Ravensburg had killed a Heimburg in a quarrel, and since that time a bitter feud had divided the two houses. The brave knight felt this bitterly, but in spite of it he did not leave off his wooing. The young Countess was much touched by his constancy and one day she spoke thus to her impetuous suitor. My lord, if you will dare to go to the Holy Land, there to expiate the sins of your fathers and bring me back a relic from the sepulchre of our Redeemer, in that same hour your suit will be heard. The knight, in great joy, kissed the maiden's slender hand and departed, carrying the memory of her sweet smile away in his heart. Just at this time, the call of the Emperor Barbarossa, now an old man, sounded throughout the land, and the knight of Ravensburg did not neglect the opportunity, but hastened forth to join the imperial army. The expedition was a long and terrible one, and the troops wearily made their way across the desert plains of Palestine. The knight, though a brave man, had no special love for warlike adventures, and during these exhausting marches he thought sorrowfully of his quiet castle and nigh of how he used to lie down there in peace and safety at night without being in fear of the saccharines who, under cover of darkness, would break in waving their scimitars in air, an event which was a nightly occurrence on this expedition. Ravensburg, however, fought bravely in many a battle, and after the deaths of Barbarossa and his son he joined the army of Richard the Lionhearted. Through all this anxious time he never forgot his dear one at home, and his longing for her became stronger every day, until it seemed to get beyond endurance. King Richard was called back to England on some urgent state affairs, and the Knight of Ravensburg was among the few companions in arms who embarked with him. The brave knight was very happy, and while the king's ship was sailing along the coast of Greece and up the blue Adriatic Sea, he would often stand on deck and weave bright dreams of the future. Sometimes, when no one was near, he would pull out a little black ebony box set with precious stones, on which a woman's name was written in golden letters. The interior was beautifully lined with costly silk, and a small splinter of wood lay within which the knight would kiss most reverently. He had paid a large sum of money for it in the Holy Land, where he had brought it from a Jewish merchant. This man had sworn to him that this fragment was from the cross to which the Son of God had been nailed. The knight was very happy during this long homeward journey, but a great misfortune awaited him. Just as the crusaders came in sight of Italy, their vessel was wrecked. The king of England, the knight of Ravensburg, and a few others were saved with great difficulty and brought to land. But our poor knight was inconsolable. He had held the precious little box high above him in the water, but a mighty wave had torn it from him, and on opening his eyes he found himself on shore. The holy relic had saved him, but he had lost his treasure, and now all hope of his promised happiness was gone. One day a weary and dispirited crusader returned to the castle of Heimburg. 
He announced his arrival to the young countess most humbly, but she, her lovely face lighted up by a bright smile, hurried to meet the knight whose sunburnt countenance betokened great hardships. She listened silently to his mournful story, then, raising her beautiful head, she asked, Was not the little box set with precious stones, and was not my name in golden letters on it? Yes, noble lady, said the knight, the bitterness of his disappointment newly awakened. And now it lies at the bottom of the sea, in spite of my fervent prayers to St. George to save the precious fragment of our Saviour's cross. The countess beckoned to a page, and after a few minutes the boy brought her on a velvet cushion a little black ebony box, set with precious stones with a woman's name written on it. The knight uttered a cry of joyful surprise, for he recognized the jewel at once. Entreat the holy patron of knighthood to pardon you, said the countess with a smile. A strange knight brought this to the steward a few days ago, and before I had time to send for him, he had disappeared. It was St. George himself, whispered the knight, crossing himself piously, which proves that the fragment really belonged to the Holy Cross. Then he bent his knee before his charming mistress, who, with a deep blush on her cheeks, gave the man she had long but secretly loved, love's first kiss. A happy marriage was speedily celebrated in Heimberg. The knight of Ravensburg then called his castle Spanheim, span being the German word for chip, in memory of the precious little relic. This name was later on corrupted into Sponheim. There is a very melancholy legend connected with the foundation of St. Clement's Church, which was built on the banks of the Rhine, and which, not long since, was rebuilt and renovated by the generosity of the present great lady of Rheinstein Castle. Rodolphus of Habsburg, elected emperor after the terrible anarchy which had reigned in Germany when the land was left without a ruler, determined by a firm and vigorous government to put an end to the evil doings of the robber knights who held sway along the Rhine. He had already threatened these much-dreaded nobles who disturbed the peace of the country and the government of its ruler, and now hearing that they still continued their ravages, the emperor appeared himself in the Rhine countries, resolved to annihilate them and to destroy their strongholds. On his way through the land, Rodolphus set fire to all the strongholds on the Upper Rhine. The burning of the castles of Reichenstein, Sunek, Heimberg, and others was an awful sight to the inhabitants of the valley below. Numerous members of these ancient noble races met the death of felons, and their bodies were hung up on trees as a warning to others. Through the gates of Mainz, Many a robber baron was led as a prisoner by the soldiers of the emperor. Every time that one of these barons and his companions in arms were led along with bound hands towards the imperial tribunal, young and old, rich and poor, poured forth from the streets and alleys and accompanied the high-born malefactors with curses. The windows of the houses around were filled with eager onlookers, admiring the conduct of their emperor. Moaning and wailing were then heard throughout the land, mothers, wives, and daughters weeping for their dead. On the other hand, the merchants who had endured hardships and sufferings during these years were now delighted with the stern justice dealt out by the emperor. Under cover of darkness, stealthy forms could be seen creeping to the place of execution, and silently and mournfully taking away the bodies of their relatives to preserve them from ignominious destruction. They then buried the wretched remains in consecrated ground, hoping thus to satisfy the fears which haunted them of future punishment, for many of their dear ones had stained their swords with the blood of their neighbors. In order to atone for these sins, and in accordance with the wise counsel of a priest, the trees on which the bodies had been hanged were cut down, and the wood used to build a chapel of expiation. Stones were also taken from the smoking ruins of the burning castles, and employed for the same purpose. The little church was built on the lonely place of execution on the Rhine near Osmanshausen. The day arrived, a day of great sorrow and weeping, when all was ready and the priest was to read prayers from the altar for the first time. Many funeral barges were to be seen on the river, bringing the dead who were buried in the aisle of the church. The archbishop of Mainz absolved the bodies from their sins and afterwards they were all interred together near the little church for the second time. This occurred towards the end of the 13th century. For long years afterwards, 
Prayers were offered up in this church in Osmanshausen for the souls of the dead. The once proud and mighty races gradually died out, and their strongholds fell into ruins. And time, which had demolished the castles on the heights above, began her work of destruction on the little church below. Its roof decayed, and its walls crumbled. The ancient little church of St. Clement has since that time been raised again from its ruins, and now the voice of God's priest is heard chanting in it again, as it was heard six hundred years ago. In Castle Rheinstein once lived a knight called Diethelm, who devoted himself without restraint to all the excesses of the robber barons. From one of his pillaging expeditions, he brought back a charming maiden called Juta. As the delicate ivy twines itself round the rough oak and clothes its knotty stem with shimmering velvet, so in time the gentle conduct of this maiden changed the coarse baron to a noble knight, who eschewed pillaging and carousing, and ultimately made the fair Juta the honored wife of her captor. The first fruit of their love cost the tender mother her life. Gerda, however, who much resembled her mother, grew to such a noble beauty that soon wooers from far and near came to sue for the hand of the beautiful daughter of the aged Ditam. But the aged knight made a most careful selection, and many gay wooers had to depart in sorrow. One young man was, however, regarded favorably by the maid, and not unkindly looked upon by the old man. He was the oldest son of the owner of the Sternberg. This young man had contrived to win the maiden's heart, and one day, while Gerda presided as queen of love and beauty at a tournament held in the courtyard of Castle Rheinstein, Helmbrecht made an avowal of his love. Some days thereafter, the young lord, according to courtly fashion, appointed his uncle Guslen of Reichenstein to woo his chosen bride for him. But Gunzlin, though an old man, was full of knavery and falsehood, and so instead of wooing for his nephew, he ingratiated himself with Gerda's father. Moreover, as the old knight was descended from an ancient family and possessed of much wealth, Diethelm was easily induced to promise him the hand of the fair Gerda. To the astonishment of this worthy pair, Gerda would not listen to the suit of her rich wooer. Her heart belonged to the nephew, not to the uncle. Now, Count Diethelm was aroused, and with the blind fury of his earlier years, swore to his rich companion that Gerda belonged to him, and should never wed the young cock-sparrow of the Sternberg. In her quiet chamber the unhappy maiden wept out of her heart's grief, but burning tears did not thaw the ice-cold heart of her father. In vain, the young lover tried to gain the old knight's favor, but Dietam merely referred to his knightly word, solemnly pledged to the lord of the Reichenstein. Soon the day approached on which Gunzlen, with the smiling self-satisfaction of an old rue and decked out to give himself all the appearance of young manhood, was to lead the fairest maiden in the Rhineland to his stately castle. Gerda, who possessed the mild disposition of her deceased mother, had submitted to the inevitable. On a bright summer morning the bridal procession started from the courtyard of Castle Rheinstein and moved towards the Clements Chapel situated in the neighborhood. Horns blew and trumpets sounded. On a milk-white palfrey sat the fair young bride, deadly pale. She was thinking of her absent lover, who in this hour must be enduring the greatest anguish on her account. Then all at once a swarm of buzzing gadflies came out of the bush and fastened fiercely on the palfrey which bore the fair Gerda. The animal reared and broke from the bridal procession. Boldly, the bridegroom on his grandly caparisoned steed dashed forward to check the frightened animal but his war-horse, missing its footing on the narrow bridle-path, fell over a precipice carrying its master with it. The dying knight was carried by the wedding guests back to Castle Rheinstein. The aged Dietam was also unfortunate in his attempt to stop the runaway steed. The maddened animal had struck him on the shin-bone and wounded him. The servants were thus obliged to carry the moaning greybeard back to his castle as speedily and carefully as possible. 
The surgeon had a sad time of it during the next week as he attended to the enraged old knight's wounds and bruises. When the runaway horse had disappeared round a bend of the path, a man threw himself upon it, and bringing the trembling animal to a standstill, clasped the unconscious bride in his arms. Helmbrecht, concealed in the brushwood, had been watching the bridal procession, and now came to the rescue of his true love. When the old lord heard of this, he came to his senses and gave the lovers his blessing. Some weeks later, a bridal procession advanced from the Clements Chapel up to the festively decorated Castle Rheinstein. Trumpets were blown and horns resounded. Much more joyfully than on the previous occasion, the musicians marched in front. Upon a milk-white palfrey, as formerly, sat a noble maiden in bridal state, clothed in undulating robes bordered with fur. Her head was bent in maiden modesty as she listened to the endearments which the youthful knight whispered in her ear. Behind rode the father of the bride, sunk in thought, and along with him was his pious sister, Notburg, the canoness of Nonnenworth. A life of unalloyed married bliss followed this union, and God granted to the noble pair a long and happy life. They rest together in front of the altar in the Clements Chapel, which is situated across the Rhine from Osmanshausen. Castle Rheinstein stands in renewed youthful beauty on the edge of a precipitous cliff overlooking a noble stream. In his stronghold at Sunek, Siebold, one of the most rapscacious of the robber barons, presided over a godless revel. Wanton women with showy apparel and painted cheeks lolled in the arms of tipsy cavaliers. The music blared, and to complete their carousal, wine flowed freely. The lord of Sunak, flushed with drinking and leering on the assembly with evil-looking eyes, he spoke as follows. Noble ladies, drunken applause from his worthy associates, and much-married nobles loudly giggled the shameless females. After food and drink, I, as your host, will be pleased to entertain you by bringing you a ferocious animal which I keep confined here. While the ladies pretended to take shelter timidly behind their lords and the men stared at their host expecting some further explanation, the doors of the room opened, and led by two servants, a man in coarse garments and with unkempt hair and beard stood before them. The suppressed whisper passed round the festive board, and all eyes were fixed on the haggard countenance of the prisoner. When, for a moment, the weary eyelids were raised, two ghastly cavities were visible. Again, with the same tone of levity, the lord of the castle spoke. Lovely ladies and knightly companions, the best marksman on the Rhine was Hans Weit of Furstenek. Like ourselves, he was dreaded far and near. He and I entered on a feud of life and death. He went down. With broken brand and battered shield, bleeding from numerous wounds, I lay prostrate before you, awaiting manfully the death thrust, murmured the prisoner, and his voice sounded as if from the grave. It pained me to finish him off, said Siebold flippantly. I got his two eyes taken out and thus added to my collection of rarities the best archer on the Rhine. My murdered eyes behold your scorn, said the prisoner harshly. But surely chivalry still flourishes on Sunek, said the lord of the castle. Understand then that my servants have informed me that even blind you can, guided only by sounds, hit a given mark with the bolt. If you come out of this ordeal successful, freedom shall be the reward. Stormy applause greeted these words. Death went nearer to me than life, murmured the blind archer. As he seized the crossbow, however, a gleam of joy went over his countenance like a ray of sunshine over a somber landscape. Crowded together in a corner of the room, the guests watched the proceedings. The lord of Sunek seized a goblet and ordered the prisoner to draw upon it after hearing the sound. In the next moment the silver clang resounded as the goblet fell on the floor. Shoot now, said Siebold of Sunek, and immediately 
an arrow pierced his mouth. With a grunt like a slaughtered ox, Seabold sank among the rushes. Silent and motionless, with the two eye cavities gaping, stood the blind man. Then his shaggy head sank on his heaving breast. Like a flock of frightened crows, the knights and their paramours fled, and only a few terrified squires and servants muttered prayers over the body of the Lord of Sunak. Lambert of Burstenberg was a hardy, jovial knight, and had married Wiltrude, a daughter of the Florsheim family. He was attached to his gentle wife, who had just presented him with a son and heir. But an evil genius entered the castle in the person of a noble maiden called Lucard. This maiden, who had suddenly been left an orphan, belonged to a family long befriended by the house of Furstenberg. She was only eighteen, but possessed a lascivious beauty, very dangerous to men. The lady of the castle, who had been in delicate health since the birth of her child, gave Lucard a warm-hearted welcome into the bosom of her family, trusting that the young woman would be a great service to her in the management of her little realm, and would repay her kindness by sisterly love and sympathy. Lucard, however, was of a vain and frivolous disposition, and had little love for household affairs or womanly duties. As the months passed, Lucard's ripening and dangerous beauty gained gradually and almost imperceptibly more and more influence over the susceptible heart of the lord of the castle, and soon the day came when he yielded himself entirely to the charms of this beautiful woman. Wiltrude's eyes were by no means blind to the shameful ingratitude of the adulteress and the godless conduct of her husband. Her weakness, however, prevented her from calling down the judgment of heaven on the sinners. Lucard, led on by her unbridled passion, now formed a devilish design which would enable her to take the place of the lawful wife of Lambert. One night, she slipped into the chamber of the lady of the castle, approaching the bed of the sleeping woman with a cat-like step, and smothered her with her pillows, the poor invalid offering but a feeble and ineffective resistance. Wiltrude's death was deeply mourned by the household, who believed that she had died of a broken heart. Lambert, too, might be grieved, but in the arms of his raven-locked enchantress he soon forgot his deceased wife, and in a few weeks Lockhart was made Lady of Furstenberg. The little boy whom Wiltrude had borne to her unfaithful husband was hateful to the second wife, who fondled her lord and flattered him with the hope of the children she would bear him. Then it was arranged that the knight's firstborn should be handed over to the care of an old crone who lived in a remote tower of the castle. One night this old woman awoke suddenly and was terrified to see a female form dressed in a flowing white robe bending over the cradle of the little boy who slept near. The woman seemed to be tending the child, and after blessing him she vanished. The old woman crossed herself, and in terror muttered many prayers. In the early morning she hurried to her new mistress in great agitation and with white lips told her of the strange visitor. Lockhart, at first, laughed in her usual frivolous manner at this ridiculous story, but soon she became more serious and alarmed. Then she ordered the old woman to arrange her bed beside the other servants, but still to leave the child in the tower chamber. A dreadful fear had taken possession of Lockhart's guilty soul. Perhaps people were deceived when they believed Wiltrude to be dead, and thus it was that she had returned at night to nurse her child. Then this daring and sinful woman prepared a bed for herself in the lonely tower beside the child. She also brought with her a formidable dagger, and thus she awaited what the night might bring forth. At midnight, the female figure dressed in the flowing white robe appeared once more. It approached the cradle of the child, tended him, and blessed him. Then the terror-stricken Lucard stared motionless at the apparition as it rose and approached her bed. Towering there above her were the pallid features of the dead Wiltrude, and the lifeless entreating eyes looked steadily at this sinful woman who had taken the place of her benefactress. To Lucard it seemed as if a great precipice was slowly bending over to overwhelm her. With a last mad effort, the wretched woman seized the dagger and struck at the apparition, but she might as well have struck at a misty cloud. Now, 
Lockhart perceived that she was in the presence of the murdered lady of the Furstenberg, and harrowed with the thought of her guilt, she seemed to hear a voice as if from another world saying, Do penance by thy sins. Next morning, Lambert waited in vain for his wife to appear. On looking around, however, he noticed a piece of parchment. On it, Lucard had confessed with deep sorrow how she had murdered his first wife in order to further her evil designs and how the spirit of the dead had appeared to her in the night and warned her of her great guilt. She was going to fly to a cloister to do penance during the remainder of her days, and she recommended her sinful accomplice to do the same. Lambert of Furstenberg was deeply grieved on receiving this revelation. He handed over his castle and child to a younger brother and spent the rest of his life as a solitary hermit. Ancient Bacharach was once a famous place, and long before the fiery wine that grows there became famous throughout the world, it was in the good old times, as our grandmothers say, it was the delight of many a connoisseur abroad. About that time, its grateful lovers erected an altar to Bacchus, who provided them so liberally with wine. The place of sacrifice was on a huge rock projecting out of the Rhine between an island and the right bank of the river, and in honor of the god they gave the town the name it still bears. The inscriptions on the altar stone have become unintelligible, but the Bacharach folk know well to this present day the original meaning of them. Fishermen still keep up the old custom, but now more as an amusement. They dress up a straw man as Bacchus, place him on the altar, and surround him singing. The ruins of the castle of Stalek are situated on the Rhine, above the wild romantic country of Bacharach. About the time of Conrad III, the first emperor of the house of Hohenstaufen, a young ambitious knight, Palatinate Count Hermann, inhabited this castle. Being a nephew of the emperor, this aspiring knight considered his high and mighty relationship as a sufficient reason for enlarging his dominions. He conceived no less a plan than that of taking possession of part of the property which bordered on his land, belonging to the archbishops of Mainz and Treves, supporting his claim by declaring that for more than one reason he had a right of possession. The jealousy, which at that time existed between the clerical and the secular powers, brought a number of neighboring knights to his side as allies, and the count began his unprovoked quarrel by taking a castle at Treves on the Mosul by storm. This castle belonged to the diocese of that town. Adalbert of Montserrat, a man of undaunted character, was then bishop both of Treves and Metz. He at once collected his warriors to drive the bold robber from the conquered castle. The temerity of the count and his superior forces dismayed Adalbert, giving him grounds for sober reflections. But the good bishop was a clever man, and, not believing himself sufficiently strong to resist the count, he sought refuge in spiritual weapons. When his people were about to assault the stronghold, he made a most enthusiastic speech to his troops. Holding up a crucifix in his right hand, he told to them that in the silent hours of the previous night, the archangel Michael had appeared to him, and given him this crucifix, and at the same time promising him certain victory if each of his warriors attacked the enemy in the firm belief that an invincible, higher power was near to help them. The bishop's words inspired his men with a great courage. Led on by the holy man carrying the crucifix in his raised hand, they marched on to the assault, stormed the castle, and made Hermann's troops flee in great confusion. The ambitious count, now finding himself deserted by his troops, was forced to renounce the feud which he had hoped to carry on against the bishop. The disgraceful defeat the count had suffered was most humiliating to him, but it had not killed his ambition. He now directed his thoughts to his other ecclesiastical neighbor. Having searched through some ancient documents, he thought he had found full right to a strip of land which Arnold of Solenhofen, Bishop of Mainz, then held in possession. He at once sent in his claim to this mighty prince of the church, who received it with a scornful laugh. Oh, said the bishop, tearing up the written complaint. I shall be able to manage this little count as well as I have all along managed the stubborn people of Mainz, some of whom have bitterly repented of having rebelled against their bishop. 
Herman was told how Solnhofen had treated his claim. In great wrath, he swore to take vengeance on the man who had dared to tear up his complaint so contumeliously. His young wife implored him with tears in her eyes not to raise his hand against the servant of the Lord again, but he turned contemptuously away. Herman was well aware that, through the influence of the bishop's companion in arms, he was now hated by the citizens of Mainz. This circumstance made him determined to rob Arnold of land and dignity, as he ascribed the cause of this deadly dissension to the power the bishop exerted over the people of his diocese. The count, now joined by several daring knights, again prepared to make war against the representative of the church and marched to attack the bishop in his stronghold. Arnold was enraged at this persistent striving against the dominions of the church, and his dark soul conceived a dastardly plan to rid them all of their enemy. He hired two villains who treacherously put the count to death. Soon afterwards, the rebellious citizens of Mainz successfully stormed the bishop's palace and turned the cruel prelate out of his episcopal seat, whereupon he was obliged to flee for his life. But Arnold was not so easily subdued, and he soon returned breathing vengeance. His friends warned him in vain, and even the famous prophetess Hildegard of Rupertsburg sent a messenger to him with the words, Turn to the Lord, whom you have forsaken, your hour is near at hand. But he heeded not this admonition, and at last he was killed by the rebels in the abbey of Jacobsburg, some distance from the town where he had taken up his residence. About the middle of the thirteenth century there was a stately castle near Kaub which was inhabited by Count Philip of Falkenstein. There he lived very happily with his beautiful sister Gutta, who was as good as she was fair. Numerous knights had sought to win her love, but none had achieved this conquest, the castle maiden having no desire to exchange her brother's hospitable home for any other. At that time, a magnificent tournament was held at Cologne, to which knights from all countries of the kingdom, far and near, and even from England, were invited. A great multitude of spectators were assembled to see the stately knights contending for the prize which a fair hand would bestow on them. Among the nobles present at the tournament was a knight from England, whose graceful figure and splendid armor were particularly striking. He wore a veiled visor, and the stewards of the tournament announced him under the name of the Lion Knight, a golden lion ornamenting his shield. Soon, the majestic knight's master-like manner of fighting created a great sensation, and when he succeeded in unhorsing his opponent, a most formidable combatant, Loud rejoicings rang through the lists. Count Philip and his sister were among the guests. Guta had been watching the strange knight with ever-increasing interest during the tournament, regretting at the same time that she could not see his face. But an opportunity soon presented itself when the knight was declared victor. When she was selected to present the prize, a golden laurel wreath to the winner, she became much embarrassed, and a feeling such as she had never before experienced seized her as she looked on the Briton's face for the first time. Perhaps the knight may have read in the lovely maiden's countenance what she in vain tried to hide from him. Perhaps a spark from that passionate fire which had so suddenly fired her heart may have flown into his soul as he knelt before her to receive the wreath, which she placed on his head with a trembling hand. Who can tell? Afterwards, when these two were conversing together in subdued whispers, the knight silently admiring her grace and the maiden scarcely able to restrain her feelings, the thoughts which he longed to tell her flamed in his heart. The same evening in the banqueting hall, when the music was sounding within its walls, he was Gouda's inseparable companion, and eloquent words flowed from his lips telling her of the love which his eyes betrayed. The proud stranger begged Gouda for her love and swore to be hers, he told her he must at once return to his country where urgent duty called him, but that he would come back to claim her in three months' time. Then he would publicly sue for her hand and declare his name, which circumstances compelled him to keep secret for the time being. Love will make any sacrifice. Gouda accepted her lover's pledge willingly, and thus they parted under the assurance that they would soon meet again. Five months had passed. That terrible time ensued when Germany became the battlefield of the party struggles over the election of the emperor. 
Conrad IV, last of the House of Hohenstaufen, had died in Italy. In the northern countries there was a great rising against William of Holland, who was struggling for the imperial throne. Alfonso of Castile was chosen king in one part of the country, while Richard of Cornwall, son of John, king of England, was elected in another. But Richard, having received most influential votes, was crowned at Aix-la-Chapelle, and from thence he started on a journey through the Rhine provinces, to the favor of which he had been chiefly indebted for his election. Spring was casting her bright beams over waves and mountains in the valley of the Rhine, but in Wachenstein Castle no ray of sunshine penetrated the gloom. Guta, pale and unhappy, sat within its walls, weaving dreams which seemed destined never to be fulfilled. Sometimes she saw her lover dying on a terrible battlefield with her name on his lips. Then again, laughing and bright with a maiden from that far-off island in his arms, talking derisively of his sweetheart of the Rhine. She became more and more conscious that she had given him her first love, and that he had cruelly deceived her. Sorrow and grief had taken possession of her, and all of her brother's efforts to amuse her and to distract her attention were in vain. A great sound of trumpets was heard one day on the highway, and a troop of knights stopped at the castle. Guta saw the train of warriors from her window where she had been sitting weeping. The Count, with chivalrous hospitality, received them and led them into the banqueting hall. His astonishment was great when he recognized the bold Briton, the victor at the tournament in Cologne, as the leader of this brilliant retinue, who had broken his secret pledge to his beloved sister. A dark glance took the place of the friendly expression on his face. The Briton seemed to notice it, and pressing Philip's hand, said cordially, I am Richard of Cornwall, elected Emperor of Germany, and I have come here to solicit the hand of your sister Guta, who promised herself to me five months ago in Cologne. I come late to redeem my promise, but my love is unchanged. I beg you to announce my arrival to her without betraying my name. Philip bowed deeply before the illustrious guest, and the retainers respectfully retired to a distance. The great guest strode up and down the room impatiently. Then the doors were suddenly thrown open, and a beautiful figure appeared on the threshold, her face glowing with emotion. With a low cry, Guta threw herself into her lover's arms, and the first moments of their reunion were passed in silent happiness. Philip now entered the room unperceived, and revealed the secret to his sister. The maiden, in great confusion and shame, stole a look at her lover's eyes, and he, drawing her gently to him, asked her to share all, even his throne, with him. Shortly afterwards, Richard celebrated his marriage with imperial magnificence at the castle on the Rhine, which Philip thenceforward called Gutenfels, in honor of his sister. The scattered ruins of an old knight's tower are still to be seen on one of the heights near Oberwesel. The castle was called Schoenberg, after the seven virgins who once lived there and whose beauty was renowned throughout all the Rhine countries. Their father had died early, some say of grief, because heaven had denied him a son, and an elderly aunt had striven in vain to guide the seven wild sisters, but her influence had not been sufficiently strong to lead them in the right way. After the death of this relative, the seven beautiful maidens were left to themselves, and now their longing after liberty and the pleasures of the world broke out even stronger than before. Many a tale was told about them, how they used to ride out hunting and hawking, how many a magnificent banquet was given by them, and how their beauty, their riches, and the gay and joyous life led by them attracted many knights from near and far, how many a stately noble came to their castle to woo one of the sisters, and how these maidens at first ensnared and enchanted him with a thousand attractive charms, only in the end to reject the enamoured suitor with scorn and mockery. Ashamed and very wrathful, many a great knight had left the castle, and with the indignation and disdain had blotted out his memory the names of these bewitching sirens who at first had listened with deceitful modesty to his honest wooing, only afterwards to declare with scornful laughter that their liberty was so dear to them that they would not give it up to the sake of any man. Alas, there were always youths to be found who put no faith in such speeches, and, trusting to their great names and particular merits, sought their happiness among these maidens. But all the trials ended in the same mournful manner. 
no suitor succeeded in winning the heart of these seductive beings. Thus, they continued their dangerous and contemptible life for some years. Once again there was a great banquet and feasting in the halls of the castle. A circle of knightly figures sat round the brilliant board among the seven sisters who were quite conscious of their charms, one rivaling the other in gaiety and liveliness. The joyous scene was disturbed for a short time by two knights who were disputing about one of the sisters and had angered each other by their growing jealousy. The scene excited general attention and was looked on at first as a most amusing one, but when the youths were about to draw their swords, it was thought necessary to separate them. Seizing this opportunity, one of the other knights proposed that, to guard against further discord, the castle maidens should be urged to make a final decision, so that each suitor, they all recognized one another as such, might know what he had to expect. The proposal met with general applause, only the sisters showed discontentment, declaring that they could not agree to such a presumptuous plan. However, the wooers tried every imaginable means of persuading them, and at last one of the sisters wavered, a second followed her example, and the remaining ones, after whispering to each other for some time, declared with laughing countenances that they would decide the fate of their suitors the next day. The expected hour arrived, and the knights in great suspense assembled in the large hall. Every eye was riveted on the door through which these graces should enter, bringing a sweet surprise to some or a bitter disappointment to others. The folding doors were suddenly thrown open, and an attendant announced that the mistresses of the castle were waiting to receive the knights in the garden, near the river. The numerous suitors all hurried out. To their great astonishment they saw the fair ones all seated in a boat on the Rhine. With a peculiar smile they beckoned the knights to approach, and the eldest sister standing up in her seat made the following speech. You may all throw your hopes to the winds, but not one of us would dream of falling in love with you, much less of marrying you. Our liberty is much too precious to us, and we shall not sacrifice it for any man. We are going to sail down to Cologne, to the property of a relation, and there we shall disappoint other suitors, just as we have misled you, my noble lords. Goodbye, goodbye. The scornful speech was accompanied by a scoffing laughter, which was echoed by the other sisters, and the boat set sail. The rejected suitors stood speechless with shame and anger. Suddenly, a terrible storm arose, and the boat was agitated violently, and the laughter of the seven sisters turned to cries for help. But the roaring of the waves drowned their voices, and the billows rushed over the boat, burying it and the seven sisters in the depths below. Just on the spot where these stony-hearted maidens met their deaths, seven pointed rocks appeared above the surface of the water, which up to the present day are still to be seen, a salutary warning to all the young maidens of the country. Above Kerblins, where the Rhine flows through hills covered with vineyards, there is a steep rock, round which many a legend has been woven, the Lorelei Rock. The boatman gazes up at its gigantic summit with awful reverence when his boat glides over the waters at twilight. Like chattering children, the restless waves whisper round the rock telling wonderful tales of its doings. Above, on its gray head, the legend relates that a beautiful but false nymph clothed in white with a wreath of stars in her flowing hair, used to sit and sing sweet songs until a sad tragedy drove her forever away. Long, long ago, when night in her dark garment descended from the hills and her silent comrade the pale moon cast a silver bridge over the deep green stream, the soft voice of a woman was heard from the rock, and a creature of divine beauty was seen on its summit. Her golden locks flowed like a queenly mantle from her graceful shoulders, covering her snow-white raiment so that her tenderly formed body appeared like a cloud of light. Woe to the boatsmen who passed the rock at the close of day! As of old, men were fascinated by the heavenly song of the Grecian hero, so was the unhappy voyager allured by this being to sweet forgetfulness. His eyes, even his soul, would be dazzled and he could no longer steer clear of reefs and cliffs, and this beautiful siren only drew him to an early grave. Forgetting all else he would steer towards her, already dreaming of having reached her, but the jealous waves would wash round his boat and at last dash him treacherously against the rocks. The roaring waters of the Rhine would drown the cries of agony of the victim, who would never be seen again. 
But the virgin, to whom no one had ever approached, continued every night to sing soft and low till darkness vanished in the first rays of light, and the great star of day drove the gray mists from the valley. Ronald was a proud youth, and the boldest warrior at the court of his father, the Palatinate Count. He heard of this divine enchanting creature, and his heart burned with the desire to behold her. Before having seen the water nymph, he felt drawn to her by an irresistible power. Under a pretense of hunting, he left the court and succeeded in getting an old sailor to row him to the rock. Twilight was brooding over the valley of the Rhine when the boat approached the gigantic cliff. The departing sun had long sunk below the mountains, and now night was creeping on in silence. The evening star was twinkling in the deep blue firmament. Was it his protecting angel who had placed it there as a warning to the deluded young man? He gazed at it in rapture for some time until a low cry from the old man at his side interrupted him. Lorelei, whispered he, startled. Do you see her, the enchantress? The only answer was a soft murmur which escaped from the youth. With wide eyes he looked up and lo, there she was. Yes, this was she, this wonderful creature, a glorious picture in a dark frame. Yes, that was her golden hair, and those were her flowing white garments. She was hovering above on the rocks, combing her beautiful hair. Rays of light surrounded her graceful head, revealing her charms in spite of the night and the distance, and as he gazed her lips opened, and a song thrilled through the silence, soft and plaintive, like the sweet notes of a nightingale on a still summer evening. From her height she looked down into the hazy distance, and cast at the youth a rapturous look which sank down into his soul, thrilling his whole frame. His eyes were fixed on the features of this celestial being where he read the sweet story of love. Rocks, stream, glorious night all melted into a mist before his eyes. He saw nothing but the figure above, nothing but her radiant eyes. The boat crept along, too slowly for him. He could no longer remain in it, and if his ear did not deceive him, this creature seemed to whisper his name with unutterable sweetness, and calling to her, he dashed into the water. A death-like cry echoed from the rocks, and the waves sighed and washed over the unhappy youth's corpse. The old boatman moaned and crossed himself, and as he did so, lightning tore the clouds asunder, and a loud peal of thunder was heard over the mountains. Then the waves whispered gently below, and again from the heights above, Sad and dying away, sounded the Lorelei's song. The sad news was soon brought to the Palatinate Count, who was overpowered with grief and anger. He ordered the false enchantress to be delivered up to him dead or alive. The next day a boat sailed down the Rhine, manned by four hardy, bold warriors. The leader looked up sternly at the great rocks which seemed to be smiling silently down at him. He had asked permission to dash the diabolical seducer from the top of the rocks into the foaming whirlpool below, where she would find a certain death, and the Count had readily agreed to this plan of revenge. The first shades of twilight were gliding softly over mountain and hill. The rock was surrounded by armed men, and the leader, followed by some daring comrades, was climbing up the side of the mountain, the top of which was veiled in a golden mist, which the men thought were the last rays of sunset. It was a bright gleam of light enshrouding the nymph who appeared on the rocks, dreamily combing her golden hair. She then took a string of pearls from her bosom, and with her slender white hand bound them round her forehead. She cast a mocking glance at the threatening men approaching her. What are the weak sons of the earth seeking up here on the heights? said she, moving her rosy lips scornfully. You sorceress! cried the leader, enraged, adding with a contemptuous smile. You! We shall dash you down to the river below. An echoing laugh was heard over the mountain. Oh, the Rhine will come himself to fetch me, cried the maiden. Then, bending her slender body over the precipice yawning below, she tore the jewels from her forehead, hurling them triumphantly into the waters, while a low, sweet voice she sang, Hastily, hastily, O oh father dear, send forth thy steeds from the waters clear, I will ride with the waves and the wind. Then a storm burst forth, the Rhine rose covering its banks with foam, 
Two gigantic billows, like snow-white steeds, rose out of the depths and carried the nymph down into the rushing current. The terrified messengers returned to the count, bringing him the tidings of this wonderful event. Ronald, whose body a chance wave had washed up on the banks of the river, was deeply mourned throughout the country. From this time forth, the Lorelei was never seen again. Only when night sheds her dark shadow on the hills and the pale moon weaves a silver bridge over the deep green stream, then the voice of a woman, soft and low, is heard echoing from the weird heights of the rocks. The Lorelei has vanished, but her charm still remains. Thou canst find it, O wanderer, in the eyes of the maidens near the Rhine. It blooms on their cheeks, it lingers on their rosy lips, there thou wilt find its traces. Arm thy heart, steal thy will, and blindfold thine eye. As a poet of the Rhine once wisely and warningly sang, My son, my son, beware of the Rhine. The Lorelei has vanished, but her charm still remains. The ruins of Castle Rheinfels, which stand above the pretty little town of St. Gore, are the most extensive of their kind on the Rhine. The castle was erected in the middle of the 13th century by Count Dieter, a nobleman belonging to the famous Rhinish family of Katzenelbogen. It is a strongly fortified burg, and within ten years of its completion the mighty ramparts witnessed several bloody encounters. Twenty-six Rhenish cities once combined to carry the invulnerable fortress, but though some four thousand lives were sacrificed, the army retreated baffled. For centuries after this, the banner of the Hessian Landgraf waved from its battlements, none daring to attack it. Then, the fanatic Gaelic forces of the revolution entered the Rhineland and laid the magnificent castle in ruins. There is a legend associated with Rheinfels which dates from that age of chivalry when noble knights and their squires trod its courts, and this legend seems touched with the sadness of the history of the castle itself. The Count of Rheinfels was the proud father of a lovely daughter, and among her numerous wooers it was George Bromser of Rudesheim who had won the maiden's heart. No one was more incensed at this than the Knight of Berg. This knight belonged indeed to a race said to have been descended from the Archbishop of Cologne, but his disposition was evil, and his covetousness and avarice made him wish to increase what earthly possessions he had. But the lord of Rheinfels was shrewd enough and hesitated before entrusting his pretty daughter and her large dowry to such a man. As already remarked, this entirely agreed with the maiden's desire. She was really deeply in love with the chivalrous young knight of Rudesheim, but shrank, almost with aversion, from the impetuous wooing of the harsh and selfish knight of Berg. Some time after the betrothal of the lovers, the date of the marriage was fixed. Before the marriage had been celebrated, however, young Bromser appeared at Rudesheim in the early dawn on his steaming war-horse, having ridden during the night from Rudesheim to bring the following sad intelligence to his beloved. The emperor, Albrecht, had summoned the nobles to do battle against the Swiss confederates, who had renounced their allegiance, driven the imperial representatives from their land, and finally declared war against their overlord. The knights of the Rhineland were called upon to suppress the flames of rebellion. On receiving the pressing call of the emperor, Bromser did not hesitate for a moment but resolved to obey his feudal superior. At first, the young bride wept, but when her lover comforted her with words of endearment and her father praised the soldierly resolution of the young man, the maiden calmly submitted to the will of God. Before the young knight rode off, he took a young linden tree which he had pulled up in a grove, and having removed the soil with his sword, he planted the sapling in front of the castle. Then he spoke as follows to his bride. Tend this budding linden which I have planted here to the honor of my patron saint. You shall keep troth with me as so long as it flourishes, but if it fade, and may St. George in his grace prevent it, then you may forget me, for I shall be dead. The weeping bride threw herself in her lover's arms, and while he enfolded her gently with his right, with his left, he raised his sword and showed her engraved upon it in ancient letters for daily repetition the words, Preserve, O everlasting God, the body here and the soul hereafter. Help, Knight St. George. 
Then, after receiving many kind wishes from his sorrowing friends, the young soldier rode in the morning mist down through the woods to join the imperial forces. Several months passed. Then, the melancholy news got abroad in the German land that something disastrous had happened in the campaign against the Swiss peasants. At last came a trustworthy report to the effect that a bloody defeat had overtaken the proud army of Albrecht. It was at Moorgarten, where the noble hero called Arnold of Winkelried had opened up to his countrymen a pathway to freedom over his spear-pierced body. Many counts and barons found on that day a grave in the land of the Swiss, and sounds of mourning were to be heard in many a German castle. But to Castle Rheinfels no traveller brought any tidings of other weal or woe, and we can imagine with what sickness of heart the maiden waited and how her hope faded as the days and weeks slipped past. It was so long since the ill-fated army had set out against the forest cantons, and now the thoughts of men were turned in other directions, while the Swiss peasants were quietly allowed to reap the fruits of their bravery. The most sanguine found it difficult to cheer the drooping maiden of Castle Rheinfels. Then one day her former wooer, the mean, avaricious Dietrich of Berg, presented himself. It was certain that George Bromser must be dead, and he was come again to sue for the hand of so desirable a young lady. The dejected maiden informed her eager wooer that she had plighted her troth to her absent lover beside the linden tree flourishing in front of the castle. Only when this tree, consecrated to St. George, should fade, would she be released from her promise. The knight of Berg departed in anger and immediately betook himself to a wood and there selected a decayed linden, as similar as possible to the green one growing before Castle Rheinfels. In the night, he cautiously approached the castle, tore up the linden, flung it with a curse into the Rhine, and then planted in its place the withered sapling. Next morning, a morning bright with the promise of spring, the fair daughter of Rheinfels stepped out onto the lawn. A cry of pain escaped her lips when she perceived the faded tree. The days and weeks that followed were spent in deep grief. After a suitable time had elapsed, the knight of Berg again put in an appearance at Rheinfels, mightily pleased with himself. Again he sought the hand of the maiden now released from her solemn promise. Sadly but firmly, however, she told her inopportunate wooer that she would keep troth with her lover in death as in life. Then the wrath of the despised knight drove him to commit a horrible deed. In his savage anger he drew his sword and buried it in the maiden's breast. Fleeing from the scene of his dreadful crime he was suddenly seized with remorse, and, like our Lord's avaricious disciple, he went and hanged himself. Deep was the sorrow in Castle Rheinfels over the sacrifice of this innocent young bride who had kept her troth so nobly but grief and tears could not replace the lost one. In the midst of a mourning, a stranger was announced. He came from the Swiss land. After the Battle of Moorgarten, a brave Swiss had found George Bromser with broken limbs and many bleeding wounds amongst a heap of slain. In a peasant's hut, the wounded man lay long in pain and weakness. His broken limbs required long and patient attention. Finally, after much suffering, George Bromser, the last of all the campaigners, rode back to the Rhineland with his lover's name on his lips and her image in his heart. With uncovered head, the lord of Rheinfels showed the young man the grave of his beloved, and there the two men embraced each other long and silently. The young soldier pulled up the faded linden tree and hurled it into the Rhine, while on the newly made grave he planted white lilies. George Bromser did not fall in love a second time, but remained true to his chosen bride to the end of his days. We are told that in the company of knightly minstrels he sought to forget his great sorrow, and that later he composed many pretty songs. One of them has survived the centuries and was recently discovered, along with the melody, in an old manuscript. It begins... A linden stands in yonder vale. Ah, oh God, what does it there? And that is Wilhelm Ruland's Legends of the Rhine thus far. Starting on Monday, we'll be back with 
Three New Tales. This is Dan Schultz for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>